Bonds, and he is going to um, get us started on our topic. All right, great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and yes, kudos to all of you for being here on a Friday afternoon. I was just thinking, who was the genius who did that? I think it was me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll learn this time. Um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, it's not the most exciting topic I know for a Friday afternoon audience, but uh, given that we have some district personnel and some discretionary project folks, um, I'll, I'll try to keep us somewhat at the helicopter level, if you will, thinking about um, you know, how to make sure that these kinds of practices are taking place in our schools. But first, before we think about how to implement that, of course, we need to think about what are the practices involved, particularly around problem solving for Tier 1. Um, we've done previous webinars in the past looking at problem solving for Tier 1, so certainly go through our archives and you can find previous presentations about this. But for today's talk, we wanted to dig in specifically into problem analysis, the second step of our problem solving process in Florida, and to really just kind of highlight some opportunities uh, that can exist for helping schools to really make sure their tier one is healthy. Um, as a stage setting, um, just highlight the, the agenda here. We'll, we'll talk again a little bit more in depth about some of that common knowledge about the important role of tier one in the problem solving process. But most of our, our conversations today is, is just really digging into this problem solving, uh, problem analysis step. Uh, and in particular, really providing a lot of guidance on how to generate uh, comprehensive hypotheses that might address tier one issues. Um, but to, to do that, of course, we'll want to differentiate then how does this step look or how does it function across the different tiers. And so you'll see that as we look at how problem solving is applied to the different tiers, there's more similarities than differences, but um, the problem analysis step has some unique features uh, across the tiers. Uh, and then we're gonna also, in the last half of our presentation, share with you an example um, of a, a middle school example and, and to show you uh, a process in which that school went through their data and how they analyzed it and came up with um, hypotheses to, uh, to explore. Again, if you have any questions along the way, please don't hesitate to uh, type those in the chat box and Betsy or I will address those questions as they come up. Uh, so I don't suppose I really have to do a lot of basic orientation about the tiers, but certainly um, we want to highlight the fact that this really is a matter of resource allocation and I want folks from the district levels to really appreciate the fact that when we talk about tier one as being important, um, we almost sometimes, I think, in trainings need to be more specific than that with our audiences and to highlight why it's important. Um, our schools have limited resources or finite resources, and we still see a pattern in our schools, in our state, in which uh, schools are trying to fix tier one problems where majority of kids are off track for something, however defined, uh, by putting all those kids into tiers two and tier three. Uh, and so we get really a different shape to the organization at those schools where it's not a triangle anymore as much as in some cases it's an hourglass where you got a pocket of students at tier one and a large pocket of students at tier three and practically no students at tier two. Or in other cases, you've got sort of an oval, uh, if you will. We've got a few students at tier one and tier three and you got everybody else in tier two. So we want to highlight the fact that when we describe the tiers to our audiences, we need to make sure that they understand that just because they have 50% of their kids that are having behavioral issues, what you'll find them to say is, is that triangle thing that doesn't make sense and it doesn't apply to our school because we have X number of kids or we have these types of kids. The whole purpose of the triangle is to reinforce the fact that in a school for it to optimally function at supporting students as intensely as they need at tiers two and three, we have to have the sufficient amount of resources to do that. And if we put too many kids into tiers two and three, we run the risk of watering down our resources to the point where those interventions really don't work. So when we find that more than 20% of our students are off track for a given content area or domain, however that's defined with criteria, that should point us to looking at system, systemic variables. Um, clearly there are some child characteristics that we can still explore at tier one, but when we have that many students, we really have to look at the, the larger organizational climate and, and uh, context. Um, so right away, when we think about more than 20% of our kids being off track, we need to think we've got a systems problem. Um, so the problem solving process in Florida that we use, um, it's often referred to as the G-TIPS, uh, the guiding uh, tools for implementation of problem solving. There's a document that's available on the Florida Department of Education as well as our Florida MTSS webpage. 
Uh, if you're not familiar with this process, then certainly please contact us or the RTI project. Um, and uh, we'll connect you, obviously, with between your district coordinators and our folks to make sure then that you have the sufficient resources to um, explore implementing this process in your schools. But if schools are not implementing this, this should be a huge red flag for you. Uh, if schools are not using a structured problem solving process you've uniformly across the school at all tiers, that should be a red flag for you. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because what we try to do in our problem solving trainings is emphasize the fact that as adults we are all problem solvers. Every one of us gets up every day and we're met with an experience that we didn't expect to have and now we've got to problem solve or work our way out of that. So even teachers, if you think about the day in and day out for them from their perspective, they're constantly uh, dealing with problems that pop up that they didn't expect to have that day or that morning in the classroom. So to treat people as if they're not problem solvers would really be a mistake. Instead, what I want to highlight though is that different people problem solve in different ways. So what that ends up re re resulting in then typically is a team of folks, let's say five people, they come around the table, they've all got different amounts of expertise and credentials and titles. Um, but because of the fact that they problem solve differently, they have a different language for how they problem solve, they have a different set of steps that they follow, a different sequence. Uh, what happens then is, is you have members for whom they don't understand the order or the sequence of activities within uh, the problem solving meeting. Or you have folks for whom they don't know where or when in the process or the agenda to contribute. Um, and, and all of this can lead to a team that can't come to consensus about what the problem is and what to do about it. So the way we have to uh, support that, of course, is to ensure that the entire school is operating with the same problem solving process and that everybody has a basic fluency with that process. Not everybody has to be able to facilitate it in a team-based setting, but members in the school should be familiar with it enough to participate it in a structured way that's efficient with the time frames that we use. <clears throat> Now, so just to give you an example of moving a, a way of thinking about problem analysis down to tier one is to first think about this as an individual level. So when we think about individual students that need uh, behavioral supports, typically what comes to mind is the functional assessment process, the FBA, BIP process. And, and in that process, what we try to do is to understand the situational events that are associated with the misbehavior and the events in which that behavior does not occur. Um, but in this case, we're recognizing that as a setting event, we've got a student for whom they lack certain fluency or basic reading skills for the grade level that they're at. Um, and so now they're asked to engage in a reading assignment that <clears throat> presumably is way too difficult for them given the lack of skills. And so they engage in a variety of misbehaviors to escape that task. So this is a pretty typical pattern that we'll see oftentimes. It's one in which a referral comes to us as a behavior problem, but as we understand it better, we realize the intervention is going to have to be an academic solution, not a behavioral solution. But typically what happens though in the FBA and in a lot of schools, and, and, and it's close to best practice, but it's not sufficient or it's not complete, and that is what folks will end up doing then is they'll ask themselves, okay, so what's the purpose of the function? Well, in this case, we have escape. Well, then let's give them a pro-social behavior that they can use to take a break if they're trying to escape. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can certainly do that. However, every time that student takes a break, not only are we pressured to have to reinforce it because they are engaged in the pro-social behavior, but every time we reinforce it and allow them to have that break, again, they're missing instruction. So lost instructional minutes continues to be an issue when it comes to a child like this in this kind of situation. We're fine, we've taught them a pro-social behavior to avoid the misbehaviors that disrupt the classroom, but we're still not addressing the real problem, which in this case is the student is triggered by having to do reading assignments for which they have limited skills. So more comprehensively, what we need to do then is to really think about that, address the academic issue, and begin supplying interventions around academic interventions, uh, in this case for reading. Uh, we could still use the breaks as a social bridge, if you will, to help that student to still look at completing their schoolwork, and we've even incentivized them to stay in their seat longer to try to work on the task. Um, but the focus of the intervention should be on reading in this case example, not on just simply teaching them how to ask for a break in a socially appropriate way. But when we look at a student's um, approach to understanding their behavior, again, that understanding of the function or the purpose of the behavior is really, really important. And it's not to say that that's still not important when we look at tier one, but when you have 50% of your kids getting two or more referrals, we have a significant tier one problem. And to try to develop 
an individual functional assessment for 50% of your school just really isn't logically feasible. Uh, and it's certainly not the best use of your time. Instead, what we need to do before we drop into that student characteristic or motivation is to really consider the fidelity of our operations or otherwise the alignment of our instructional or adult behaviors. And, and so this graphic here is just meant to give us a place to think about the fact that between classroom climate all the way out to student outcomes, there are a variety of variables that we might want to consider that can each trigger or otherwise set the stage for inappropriate behaviors. So the classroom climate, of course, is having to do with the relationships between the teachers and the students, between the students and the other students. Um, and so to where we have issues around positive relationships in the school, that obviously is going to set the stage then for how well the other dominoes are going to be able to play out. But then we, of course, have our expectations. And so school-wide expectations for PBIS represents those same standards for behavior as the way we have standards for academics. Um, that's what we always tie our referrals to, and we always try to um, ensure that um, everybody in our school understands those expectations. Now, having expectations for what we want students to know or be able to do as a result of their interactions with us for the behavior side of our, our MTSS, um, we also then have to have a set of lesson plans to teach them those pro-social skills. So in PBIS, we're constantly reinforcing the message that you can't just simply implement school-wide expectations and classroom rules and put yourself in a reward system and then call it a day. Uh, we have to be explicit and we have to be proactive at teaching the social behaviors that we want students to engage in that prepares them to actively engage in our lessons academically. Classroom management, of course, along with choosing effective cur uh, curricula uh, uh, materials and using um, differentiated or UDL types of instructional approaches uh, is where then we also link uh, those instructional plans with our standards in providing as much differentiation as we can to match the differentiated population that we're working with in a given school or classroom. Beyond that, then, we're looking at now delivering our lessons, and this is where we get into the fidelity of our practices. So at the tier one level, this is where we're often going to find a great source of our hypotheses. Are we doing our tier one PBIS the way we're supposed to? And this is where we'll start thinking about our benchmarks of quality. And certainly that's a great place to start looking. Um, but that being a self-report measure, we're probably going to want to triangulate that information with additional sources of information. Uh, a tool that we will also um, highlight as we go through this uh, presentation is our classroom assistance tool, which also allows you to um, consider what's actually working and not working in that classroom setting, aggregate those results across classrooms, and find common patterns that might be able to be improved as a way to um, uh, improving the effectiveness of our Tier 1 efforts for behavior. Um, and then beyond that, then, of course, we're looking at, okay, well, now how are our students performing? Um, not just academically, but also social, emotionally, or behaviorally. And we consider their performance in relation to our expectations or standards. Uh, so again, this graphic is just meant to remind us that when we have a tier one problem, we need to think about a systems issue. And systems means adults, not children. Uh, we can certainly consider student motivation, but if we have an assumption that half our kids are getting way more referrals than they're supposed to, uh, and we think it's all because of escape, because the, all the referrals are coming from classroom during instructional times, it's just not really going to be useful for us to just teach half our our, our, our school how to ask for a break. Uh, we're going to have to really understand what is it about our instructional strategies that are triggering these kids to want to escape and let's really focus in on that. So um, Riley and Tillman, Burns and Gibbons, they have a, a book out um, on uh, response to intervention um, for both academics and behavior. Uh, this is a, a table that I um, adapted from their book um, just add a little bit more detail and context for it. But as you can see, when we think about Tier 1, um, the questions we should be asking ourselves about understanding why we have um, such a Tier 1 issue um, is really to understand then why are so many students off track? What would it help to explain that many students being off track? So we, we want to understand and define the problem as either a school-wide, grade-wide, or class-wide problem. And so if you're familiar with um, PBIS approaches at problem identification where you um, look through your referrals to identify sources where you might improve, um, we start thinking about those big five. You know, in what locations are the most referrals coming from? Uh, what kind of, dis um, of referral is most common? Is it disruption? Is it uh, talking in class? What is it? Um, 
time of day can help us to identify areas where we might pinpoint more supports, um, looking at the consequences that students get, et cetera. Um, so we'll, we'll distill all that data down into finding what's the one either location or behavior type <clears throat> that if we focus in on improving that in our school, will dramatically reduce our referral rates. That's different than, say, at a Tier 2 or Tier 3. Uh, at a Tier 2, our analysis focus in this problem-solving process is really more about what's that category or focus of interventions. We've got a group of kids who have behavior problems. Okay, um, but they are different than the majority of their peers who seem to be doing just fine at Tier 1, but for these kids, they don't seem to be as on track as we would like them to be. And perhaps it's just simply a matter of they have exactly two referrals for the year. It sets them at that at-risk level, but it's still only two referrals for these students. Uh, well, in that case, we might consider just some group interventions uh, around a common behavioral concern, whether it be uh, counseling, whether it be social skills training, um, character building classes, whatever it might be. So in this tier two analysis, we're really getting deeper into that understanding of is it the academics causing the behavior or is it the behavior impacting the academics or is it both? And so that would be a series of analysis questions for problem solving at tier two. At tier three, we really get more specifically into causal variables. It's no longer helpful for us to simply make assumptions uh, or hypotheses without testing them really deeply. Um, so experimental analyses types of procedures occur here. Um, where we can use a variety of CBM or CBA types of approaches, whether it's academics or behavior. Um, behavioral assessment is generally the category in which we can um, operate to help students to um, understand exactly what's going on here. And in particular, because of the nature of these kids being so significant, typically you'll find that students needing Tier 3 services need it for both academics and behavior, not just one or the other. Um, another way to look at this is, again, just the same idea across the three tiers at the top there is just look at the differences in the problem-solving steps across those tiers. And so it really, again, at that problem analysis step is let's check to make sure that we're doing what we said we're going to do at Tier 1 for both academics and behavior. Let's check to make sure that the quality of our instructional lessons is, is high. Um, let's make sure our classroom management systems are operating with best practices or evidence-based practices. Uh, and make sure the fidelity of all of that is in place. And where we have tier one issues, that should be our first bucket of hypotheses, is that perhaps we're not doing what we should do or we're not as consistent as we should be. Compare that then again to tiers two and three, it really becomes an, an issue over why did tier one not work for these students or why did tier two and tier one not work for these students? And what is it about the nature of their situation Specifically, the students now become more of a focus. Is it a skill deficit, a performance deficit? Are there antecedent options that we could um, manipulate to improve the situation? Are there consequence options that we can manipulate to improve the situation? Um, and then when it comes to generating hypotheses, it's important for us to understand that there are multiple ways in which we could organize our hypotheses. And really what it comes down to is that there are so many different variables for us to consider that are based out of research that it's just too much for any one person, no matter what expertise they have, to be familiar with all of those. And by grouping hypotheses into different domains of categories, um, it can also help serve a new team or an emerging problem solving team that's not fluent at this process or this step um, to explicitly consider areas that they might not otherwise have considered if not prompted. So again, looking at that FBA, BIP approach, what we typically look for there in terms of hypotheses is whether or not we have a situation of positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement occurring that is motivating this student to engage in misbehavior given the context situation. And again, that's a process that can be used for behavior as well as academics um, if you're not already aware of that. In fact, all of the different problem solving models can be used for both academics and behavior. Uh, these other models of um, hypothesis generations um, is, again, further evidenced in, in practices that have been attempted and used in the research literature. Um, taking that functional approach to understanding why certain behaviors are occurring and in what context, uh, that functional analysis was uh, shown to be very effective at looking at academic performance. So in that case, uh, Daly and uh, some of his colleagues in the 1990s and throughout the 2000s uh, showed very convincingly that you can use that same functional logic to understand why a student is not able to benefit from reading instruction, math, et cetera. Um, but the nature of our analysis questions has to be expanded to more than just the consequence 
focus of positive or negative reinforcement, we really have to have to consider um, you know, a lack of skills uh, being uh, available as well as what are some of the antecedent conditions. Uh, and so they'll ask a, a slightly different set of questions, but they're still all around understanding a functional relationship. Uh, the same thing with instructional hierarchy, when it comes to this, it's an important thing for us to keep in mind that for some kids, the behaviors or the social behaviors that they show us might be accurate, but they might not be that fluent at it. They're able to demonstrate pro-social behaviors in one context with their peers, but in another context, they fail to use those same strategies. Those are students for whom they've learned the behavior, but they've not learned to generalize it or they've not built fluency for it. So this also applies. We have to ask the question sometimes, is it that the student has the skill, but they're not generating or they're not able to generate it in other environments because they haven't been taught how to do that or they're not generalizing that skill to other settings? That would be a hypothesis we could consider. Behavioral fluency really supports that same idea, is to say is that when students can engage in our pro-social behaviors fluently, that is to say without thinking about it, that's our ideal, that's our criteria for uh, improving behaviors. This bottom one here though, ecological assessment, is one I really want to dig into because I find that it's really a more comprehensive way of organizing our hypotheses and it allows for us to consider the student motivation variable at the same time. Uh, so Jim Isodyke and his uh, graduate students over the many, many years um, have often um, conducted research literature reviews to better understand or otherwise compile an understanding of what are the different factors that seem to come up in the research as having an impact or an influence over social and emotional kinds of concerns. And so through that, they identified several different ecological factors. Many of these you'll recognize if you're familiar with the ISIL by riot language of the RTI training uh, methods and approaches that we use in Florida, where in this case, ISIL stands for Instruction, Curriculum, Environment, and Learner. Uh, what Isil Dyke and his folks do here is they, they take that instruction or curriculum piece, you see it's still in there, the learner piece is still in there. But when it comes to the environment, it really gets unpacked into several different areas. So school climate has its own focus, relationships has its own focus, and the instructional classroom environment uh, is also focused. This bottom one, school organization, that has to do with the degree to which um, the school operations are fluid. Uh, that staff are able to um, work with a schedule that allows them to engage in the practices that they need to engage in, um, and uh, also in being able to use a schedule that allows them to get kids access to the services that they need. And so when we think about the scope of Tier 1 pro uh, hypotheses, it's important for our teams to have that helicopter view. So at a, at a broad sense, it's really a focus over kind of which is the egg and which is the chicken here. What is it about our, act, our effective instructional strategies that might help to pre, pre, uh, prevent some of that misbehavior? Can we increase some of our uh, academic um, practices to better quality or consistency to minimize misbehaviors? Um, and in other cases, it's a classroom management issue where we don't really have a lot of student engagement taking place or this classroom management uh, system that's in place is very punitive, which is not best practice, by the way. Um, so make sure I'm in the right slide. Yes, I am. Okay, good. So having just kind of shared for you a little bit more about just what that problem solving process entails, the problem analysis steps specifically at tier one, um, we want to begin to highlight for you uh, an example of that within a case. So I'm just going to just right now um, up, provide you a little background about this school and walk you through what they did for problem identification. We won't have the time in the webinar to really walk you through all the pieces of that problem ID, so we're just going to show you a summary of that. But again, if you're looking for more information, we've done previous uh, webinars on problem solving at Tier 1, uh, and if you are familiar with our PBIS training efforts at Tier 1, you should be familiar with um, our referral system process and how to analyze those big five kinds of referral patterns. So this school is a middle school, and um, it's a large school district, about 31 elementary schools, nine middle, seven high, about 19 alternative or charter schools combined. It is a six through eight middle school and there's about over a thousand students enrolled at this school. And they have several teams that exist at this school. Uh, they do have a core leadership team that primarily focuses on the academic side, ensuring at quarterly uh, schedule um, intervals that their tier one efforts for those academic domains is where they wanna be. Uh, they have a PBIS team that specifically focuses on improving and implementing their PBIS for Tier 1, but also um, taking the lead on analyzing their Tier 1 data on a monthly basis. Uh, they also have six grade level teams. These are two per grade level. Um, primarily, these are PLCs. 
uh, where the teachers do have some participation in problem solving, but it's really more around their own classroom or their own grade level. And then when this team came together, the purpose for it was they were conducting a second quarter tier one review or a mid-year review of their PBIS efforts. And in this case, they wanted to really understand um, both their academic and their behavioral data. So by looking at the behavioral data, they began to identify opportunities in which they might also develop action steps to improve their academic side of their MTSS. So when they looked at their big five and they drilled that data down into other patterns, for example, um, you know, if we say it's a school-wide problem, is that all grade levels involved or is there one grade level in particular that's driving most of the referral rates, et cetera? Um, and in this case, what they found is that overall, across the, major the total number of their, their population, 43% uh, of their students have two or more referrals for disruption. That's definitely a serious tier one issue. And before we start thinking that this is probably just a situation where you've got five kids that are driving most of the referrals, we looked at that in that problem ID step and found that most staff, not just a few teachers, are writing those referrals and 80% of these referrals are coming from a large proportion of 6th and 7th graders. So it's not a small group of kids. These are 43% of our total population and most of those coming from our 6th and 7th graders and most of the classrooms contributing to those referral rates. So there's definitely a school-wide issue going on here. Core is is really uh, ineffective for everyone at the school except for two subgroups. Um, and in particular, there is a, a significant equity issue with African-American students at this school. Um, so we were looking at data primarily in the fall, um, but also considering that in previous patterns in previous years. And they found that 81% of their referrals were coming from the classroom location. This is often not a very um, unique or, or surprising fact um, because students do spend most of the day in classrooms. But to know that it comes from a classroom doesn't give us enough information. We also want to look at what's going on in the classroom at the time these referrals are happening. And that last bullet there under where and when is uh, showing us that these 81 referrals in the class, 81% of referrals uh, that are located in the classroom are happening during large group instruction. It's not during transition times. It's not during downtime. It's not during, uh, you know, cafeteria lunchtime. Uh, it's happening during large group instructional classroom engagement uh, activities. Uh, disruption is the primary offense, uh, accounting for about 32% of all the referrals. Um, and the most uh, frequent administrative decision is uh, phone calls to parents and warnings. So as a result of, of all of that compiling of information around what are the issues or the problems they're facing at their school, they defined their tier one problem as 43% of all students have received two or more referrals, whether that's a major or a minor, for disruption during their large group instruction. And so now having that problem ID statement, now we can begin to explore hypotheses around that. Uh, it's very important that at a team at this point in their conversation of problem solving, that any hypotheses they come up with are only around this problem statement. We don't want hypotheses that are just out of the air, connected to no data whatsoever. Uh, we wouldn't expect, for example, a team to say, well, you know, because the federal government passed this new law, uh, that has nothing to do with the specific focus of our 43% of students having two or more referrals for disruption in the classroom. So we want to make sure those hypotheses are specific to understanding why so many kids are struggling in the classroom environment during our instructional times. So now what I'm going to go ahead and do is turn it over to Betsy and she's going to walk us through more of that case study. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Um, so I think um, I definitely worked in schools where we had pretty big problems with behavior and um, the tendency can be when you see a giant catastrophic problem uh, like 43% of your kids receiving discipline referrals, um, we want to just take the hose and, and make sure the fire goes out uh, without really looking deeply at why that whole fire ignited in the first place. And so that's really where that step two comes in, that problem analysis piece. Um, and just having folks at the table who understand that you, sometimes you have to turn off the hose and figure out why the problem is happening so that you can really um, have an impact. So with our, um, with our situation, uh, we generated a hypothesis, um, which is great. Uh, we want to determine the why, but many times um, we have possible reasons for why things are occurring, but then we just make assumptions until 
but they, those are just assumptions until we can actually validate that that's the reason. Um, the better job that we do at validating those assumptions, the more likely we are to identify valid, effective interventions. So here's our problem statement. 43% of students are receiving two or more referrals for disruption in many classrooms during large group instruction. And so our next step is just the statement of why. Why do we think that's happening? Um, and again, Brian said, we wanna to steer towards those things that are systemic factors and things that we can have influence over, those things that are alterable. So we would then ask ourselves, how do we know that that's the why? How do we know that what we're deciding is the why actually is, which brings us to our assessment options. How do we validate those reasons? Um, so you can see those steps here, and I believe we actually have a handout of this too. So you can kind of keep that with you as you start to get practice in doing this um, problem analysis piece. So there's a series of steps that can lead from identifying a problem to determining whether we have identified a cause. Um, so we begin with that problem statement again, and what we want to identify are some possible reasons. And you can see here's one that we came up with. Um, one possible reason why they're receiving two or more referrals for disruption in the classroom is because teachers are not recognizing students for engaging in classroom rules. Um, so that's one thing that we brainstormed and came up with. Um, and our rationale is, you know, if we know that higher amounts of positive attention result in lower discipline referrals, we can make a prediction statement based on our hypothesis. If teachers provide higher amounts of positive attention and re rewards to students, for engaging in classroom rules, then students in those classrooms will follow classroom rules more consistently, resulting in fewer referrals for disruption. So now we need to ask, how do we know that teachers aren't providing sufficient positive attention? How, you know, how can we validate that? Or how can we evaluate that? Um, so what do you think are some ways that you could sort of evaluate whether or not um, teachers are providing sufficient positive attention? What might you look at? I'm going to give you guys a couple of seconds to think about it. I know that's our first question for right now. Oh, someone's chiming in. Classroom observations. Yes. Thank you, Christy. So I think that would definitely be my go-to for trying to validate that. And again, you there's different ways to test um, our hypothesis. You can review records, observe, interview, or test. And I think observations in this case would be um, a good method. And this is just, um, again, what Brian had talked about in terms of the different domains with which we can find um, hypotheses. So in looking at our statement about 43% of the students having two or more referrals, if you had to come up with a hypothesis other than the one that we generated, what might you go to? What might you think could be a reason why that's happening? Any ideas? I'll give you, give you guys a minute to chime in. We're just generating your own unique hypothesis. About why there are such high referrals. Christy, you must have had your afternoon coffee today. <laughs> You're on it. <laughs> Lessons are not engaging. Yeah, yeah that's a really good one. Um, and I think we all come up with hypotheses when, when behavior is starting to um, become an issue. Um, teacher tolerance, ooh, especially like this time of year, teachers are maybe a little bit more likely to uh, snap quicker <laughs> um, as we get more stressed and into the testing season. I think Brooke is coming up with a hypothesis as well. No. Okay, so for the ones that we talked about, um, lessons are not engaging. So if we looked at our hypothesis domains, what domain would that fall under? Instruction or instructional environment, yeah, absolutely. Instruction, yes. So we would know um, if we could validate that hypothesis that the lessons aren't engaging, that we would want to make 
modifications to that specific kind of domain. Thank you guys, thank you for contributing. So here are some examples um, of some that we came up with. One is that maybe during instruction, there's not enough opportunities to respond. So kids are having to sit quiet for long periods of time, which can make us, um, you know, wanna misbehave. Another example of hypothesis is that the curriculum is, is too hard. It's at a frustrational level for many of the students. Or maybe it doesn't allow students to have some choice. Um, it doesn't have a variety of, of um, activities. So students are becoming more disengaged. And then environment. Maybe expectations, rules, and routines are not being taught consistently. So those are some of the other hypotheses that we came up with. And so from there, we would want to look at the different ways that you can validate all of those types of hypotheses. And you guys already sort of talked a little bit about using teacher observation as a potential way to validate a hypothesis. We're going to look at a couple of others. Um, so here we have the opportunities to respond hypothesis. Students aren't given opportunities to respond. And I know it's hard to read that graph, but what we could kind of show with this is this would have been some walkthrough data um, looking at student engagement. And the one that's highlighted as having a very low percentage is that um, lesson delivery and engaging students in learning. So if our hypothesis is that students aren't getting an opportunity to speak and we see through the walkthrough data that that is indeed um, a valid reason, um, we could intervene with finding ways to get students to be have more of those opportunities. So here's our next one. We talked about the curriculum being at the student's frustrational level rather than instructional level. I think this is a pretty easy one. You would just want to know how are they doing on assessments? So this is a state reading assessment and that blue dotted line is the state average. And so we can see that the majority of students from different ethnic groups are falling below that state average. So it is likely that um, frustration level is, is high if the curriculum is above the level that they are currently operating at. You could also look at course failures as a source of data for whether the curriculum is meeting the needs of most students. So for this table, we can see that 14% of students who have two to five referrals are failing a course. 11.5% of students with two to five referrals are failing two courses. And so if we take all the students who have one more than one referral and more than one failing course, um, we can see that about 42% um, are not meeting both academic and behavioral success. Um, so that's another way we could validate that the students are frustrated. And so here is about the, a little bit of data about um, student choice, preference, learning activities, not being engaging for students. So basically they're bored. Um, and we could look at this as it relates to curriculum, but also instructionally, um, this may be contrib contributing to the problem. So the hypothesis is that curriculum or instruction doesn't allow for that student choice or interesting activities. And this graph shows the percentage of students who perceive that their teacher demonstrates a lesson in front of the whole class for more than half the period, or the teacher lectures for more than half the period. So if the student's perception is that the lesson isn't engaging, if they're just sitting there or they say they're just sitting there, um, this could very likely be why. And, and if, I, if I could add something real quickly, because I think it's important to you, but this is a great example also of student voice and why yeah. student voice is an important data source to consider, because if you're going to ask staff for reasons why they think kids are misbehaving mm -hmm. and we run with those hypotheses, we could be totally wrong. That's true. Um, when we get student voice involved, it can make a big difference in understanding really what's happening. So this is a graph where you ask the teachers, you know, hey, are you providing uh, classroom experiences that for the most part involve activities, not lecturing? And you've got teachers in the blue saying, why, yes, we are. But the students' perceptions is, no, all you do is talk all day. There's really nothing to do with this yeah. engaging. Um, so having that student voice can really make a difference in understanding the data. Absolutely. Um, personal story here. 
I recently had a survey that I was given for my daughter's school. She's in middle school and they were asking questions. They asked for, you know, general comments about what they could do better. So I, I texted my daughter and I was like, what do you think your school could do better? And her answer was so insightful. She said, there's so much inconsistency in the rules from class to class and it makes it confusing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, mm -hmm. that's a piece of information I think your school could really benefit from hearing. Yeah. Um, so I you know, was hopeful that maybe they would actually survey the students. I'm not sure if they're going to, but I thought, wow, that's a really good piece of data for the school to have. So thank you for adding that. Um, one other thing I wanted to say, because I don't think we included data on it, but um, the classroom assistance tool that Brian was talking about earlier um, is another great kind of walkthrough tool for coaching um, teachers uh, through the different elements that um, they could, you know, focus on in terms of PBIS implementation and doing um, a better job with uh, those behavioral constructs in the classroom. So that also generates some data like this. Um, that can help you dig a little bit deeper into things that we could be doing differently or better um, to help to improve those uh, discipline problems. And here we see the BOQ, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, and this would be a way for us to validate whether or not our expectations, rules, and routines are being taught consistently. So we can see from this data that it looks like um, things got really good in that last year, <laughs> but in the previous year, um, years lesson planning had been an issue. Um, so it may be worth diving deeper and making sure uh, that those 100% are, are an accurate reflection of what's really happening. A little side note though about this data, you'll notice that the final year that this data was captured, it's all 100%. Yeah. Um, when, when we see that, that raises a flag. Uh, <laughs> it's a very rare occurrence. Uh, it's a unicorn occurrence, I believe. <laughs> um, <laughs> But when we dug into it, we found that they had gotten a new PBIS coach at this school who thought that they were the sole individual who should fill out the BOQ. Okay. And so from their percep perceptions, they thought everything was in place. But again, it goes back to we want to remind folks that the, the power of your data from your benchmarks of quality is only as good as you use the tool effectively and appropriately. And so we always ask the entire team to do this uh, survey independently, come with their own answers to the team meeting, and then negotiate a final answer and a final version that the team all contributes to. Um, because otherwise, one person's perception will drive a lot of decision making that might not be accurate. That is a very good point. And also another reason why it's good to have multiple sources of data sometimes when you're um, trying to come to d decisions about things. Um, in this case, you could go from the BOQ to something like um, classroom self-evaluations where teachers are looking and reflecting on what they're doing in the classroom um, and, and getting down to that individual teacher level um, to see what kinds of things might need improvement. And so you can see this is a graph that would be generated from that information um, and it could be aggregated across grade level or across the school to see where teachers feel like they fall in terms of PBIS implementation. And, you know, it can provide us with some deeper insight about whether our expectations, rules, and routines are, are actually making their way into the classroom. So this is the point at which we would start to link our hypotheses. Once they're validated, we've got our data that show, yes, this is um, truly what we believe is going on, and we have some data to support that. We can start to link it to the kinds of strategies we want to use to improve it. So we had our instruction hypothesis, which was about opportunities to respond. We looked at data from walkthroughs. We maybe asked um, student perceptions of what's going on. And what we now know is that one thing we need to do is to increase opportunities to respond. So from there, we can start to come up with the who, what, how, when, how will we evaluate it around increasing um, engagement, increasing opportunities to respond. And then with curriculum, um, we talked about that frustrational level. Um, this, the curriculum is, is, is too high or it's too intense. Um, and we validated that through looking at that um, state assessment data. And what we found was that indeed, many of our students are at frustrational level with our curriculum. So that would lead us to improve strategies around 
um, making those materials more accessible to students um, and to you know individualizing or, or creating more um, differentiated materials so that everybody can access them. And again, coming up with the plan for who, what, when, where, how. Um, the second curriculum hypothesis was around student choice, not having not students feeling like they don't have choice or that things aren't interesting enough. Lots of worksheets going on. Um, and so what happens with that one, if we can validate that indeed the lessons are boring <laughs> or just not engaging enough, um, we would want to come up with improvement strategies around improving that um, the interest level of students around the lessons to make them more engaging. And lastly, that environment one. So we looked at our BOQs, we asked teachers about their perceptions of what's going on in their classroom for PBIS. Um, we maybe did some walkthroughs around the school and used that data. And we found that expectations, rules, and routines are not consistent. Um, so again, we can take some improvement steps by working on our expectations, working on teaching, um, doing lesson plans, coming up with ways to make our routines more consistent. Yeah, and, and I just want to highlight again here, there's sort of a soundbite approach that you can make to this, and that's if you do problem analysis really, really well, you'll know then what to do as an intervention focus mm -hmm. or a systems change focus, because knowing what hypotheses are valid, if something's not happening that should be happening, well, then now make it happen. Yeah. Um, if something's happening that shouldn't be happening, then make it stop happening. Right. And that's the decision making at the end of this step if you do it well. The novice teams or the teams that aren't fluent in this process, what you're going to find is that they completely skip problem analysis. They might do a decent job at problem ID, but then they run into, let's brainstorm some solutions. And they yes. start jumping into this right side of a slide here, um, thinking about strategies to improve a variety of things that they haven't even gone through the business of trying to validate yet. And so I try to remind teams that I want you to think about how much money is being spent at tier one. Add up all of your teacher's salaries plus benefits prorated per hour. Add up all the materials you've bought. Mm -hmm. Add up all the, the chairs and furniture. Add up all the space, electricity, et cetera. The PD. It's a very expensive place at mm -hmm. tier one. Um, and so when you talk about, well, we're now going to brainstorm some solutions out of thin air about how to prove tier one, and even if you come up with a great logistical plan for how to put all those ideas in place, you might spend a lot of resources that result in no improvements because we're just yeah. shotgunning it, really. Um, and so I really try to help folks understand that you can either pay time now or you can pay time later, but right. you're going to pay. It's better to pay it up front with problem analysis, do it really well, take the time to do it well, so that you know exactly what to pinpoint in your intervention plans and therefore start to see some success. Yeah. And then you can tweak and obviously adapt and modify and improve from there. Um, but that is something that, that we try to help folks understand is if you do a good job of validating, not just assuming or hypothesizing, actually validating, now you'll know what to do. I feel like this slide should have like a stop sign in between the two sides. So you have these hypotheses on one side and you have these strategies on the other, but we just did all this work and all this discussion around that middle part that takes you from that left side to the right side. Um, and that, that critical piece really does some, sometimes get neglected. Yeah. Um, so we hoped we, we hope we kind of filled your brains with some inspiration for trying to steer teams towards slowing down and, and really understanding the why. Um, and we have a couple of other resources here. Um, on our website, we have some really great classroom resources um, that can take you through um, tools that you can use in this process. Um, so if you're, as you're coming up with hypotheses as to why, um, there's some really good tools in here to help with that validation piece. Um, so we encourage you to take a look at these. And... This is also the place on our website where you would find our technical assistance chats. So there's lots of them there um, recorded for many years. And so we hope you'll take a look at those. And our next chat is going to be aligning school-based mental health with your PBIS framework. And that will be toward the end of April, April 24th. So we hope you can join us for that. And we have a little bit of time, so if anybody has any questions, we'd be happy to answer. 
and we can stick around for a little bit. Brian, do you have anything else you wanted to share? Wisdom to impart? Um, no, I guess just, again, in my experience, I would just say is just know that um, schools might say they're doing a lot of these things, mm -hmm. but to know whether or not they're doing them, that might be also a hypothesis to follow up with is maybe the reason why our interventions or our action plans at either tier is not working is because we're not really engaging in this process the right way. Yeah. So we might be getting together as a team. We might be filling out a problem-solving worksheet, whatever that means, um, because different districts have different versions that might not have all these elements in there. Mm -hmm. uh, so depending on how well your district leadership has developed tools for the schools to use to guide them through this process, um, it can create situations where teams might not really be engaging in this process fully or comprehensively to arrive at the best solutions. So, so just it's not just the fidelity of interventions is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It's also the fidelity of this process that's yeah. important. Uh, and if anybody's interested, we do have tools between both our projects, the RTI and PBS projects, that you can use to um, measure the fidelity of the problem solving process mm -hmm. at all three tiers. We have um, tools that you can go and look at meeting minutes or notes and agendas. Uh, so a review of records kind of approach, and you can indicate what's which of the sub steps in this process are being done and not done. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have an observation version of that as well, mm -hmm. that you can go and observe a team that's operating at problem solving procedures um, at any tier, and then give them feedback as to which steps they are doing well at and which steps they need to spend more time on. So if anybody's interested in some of those, just please contact us, and we'd be happy to. Um, get you in contact with those resources. And Christy is asking, do you have examples of problem solving worksheets? So Christy, I, I think we could probably get you about 67 different versions <laughs> of those worksheets because we have 67 school districts. I don't know it would help you that much. Um, what I would say though is if you're going down the avenue of wanting to make sure that we have a consistent worksheet that all our schools are using, I think that's a good step. Just keep in mind though, we don't want uh, worksheets to be the professional development vehicle. Um, we can't just give worksheets to the schools and say, just fill this out exactly in this sequence mm -hmm. and expect that process to still come through authentically and with full fidelity. Um, so we've seen that happen when we first did our RTI pilot back in the day. Um, we had a structured problem solving worksheet that we built as a template that schools could adapt and modify. Um, and we put that out there, but what we found is that um, even with those worksheets, schools needed direct training mm -hmm. on understanding what they're being asked to complete in those worksheets. So, so just make sure those worksheets are being passed out along with training. And yeah, um, Chrissy, if you want to reach out to us via email, maybe we can pass some things along mm -hmm. um, to you um, to help you in your new role. <laughs> And then Carol said, I heard Brian speak at Region 11, is that Region 11? Uh -huh. Service Center back in October. He included a slide showing PBIS framework critical components at Tier 1. Are these the same for Tier 2 and Tier 3? Uh, well, I mean, I'll have to go back to my October presentation, I suppose. But the slide showing the PBIS framework and the critical components of that, um, I believe you're referring to, uh, it's like a series of circles where we have the leadership team in the middle, and then above that we have political support, visibility, funding, uh, policy, and then down underneath it, it would be then the training, uh, coaching, data systems, mm -hmm. um, and behavioral expertise. Um, so I, I believe, Carol, that's what you're referring to as the PBIS framework. Um, that framework, we do use that with PBIS. It's specific to communicating the role of a leadership team, particularly at the district level, um, and kind of the, the twofold um, set of responsibilities that that team has. One, which is to maintain a high priority and a focus for the amount of time that's needed to get PBIS fully in place, um, but then also the technical assistance services to help schools to implement those practices uh, across the tiers for PBIS. Um, in this venue here, in this presentation, those same ideas still exist in regards to the PBIS framework, but when we talk about frameworks for generating hypotheses, that's a completely different uh, topic now. That's, that's just simply letting you know that there are different ways to organize hypotheses. So you might have come in contact with the RIPE by ISO language from the RTI project, or you might come across our CARED acronym from our disproportionality work group stuff. Um, you might be in Hillsborough County where they use Coil. Coil. Um, <laughs> you know, so 
to me, it doesn't matter what acronym mm -hmm. or different domains uh, you want to use in your district. What matters to me, though, is that at tier one, we're really looking for those systemic variables and not just going into those individual characteristics. Mm -hmm. I put up a poll, um, if you guys wouldn't mind just giving us some feedback about today's chat. Um, thank you so much for taking time on a Friday to um, chat with us. Um, we hope we provide you with some good information. And um, again, feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, and otherwise, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. And if you're starting your spring break, I hope you have a wonderful vacation. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, everyone. <laughs>